I wanted to first talk about the Kursk offensive. There's been a lot of enthusiasm about this, but in all of this enthusiasm, especially in the Western mainstream media, there has been indications of major problems, especially on the Ukraine side. And I wanted to ask you, the New York Times reported today admitting using a host of various uh, Carnegie Endowment uh, 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 found <laughs> foundation, so-called scholars and military experts talking about how Ukraine actually is in deep trouble the longer that this goes on. And of course, uh, a lot of this has to do with the fact that Russia was always going to respond and that the longer that Ukraine digs into this literal NATO-backed invasion, uh, the more likely it is that this will be destroyed. What is happening right now in this Kursk offensive, uh, Andre? And what does it spell for Ukraine? And of course, the larger Ukraine project NATO is waging. Well, um, we need to keep in mind that before we use those large words like offensive, it wasn't really an, not an offensive. It was the incursion into the what uh, in uh, tactical and operational terms described as the forefield or the cover zone of any forces, usually depending on the size of the force, uh, between you know, 10 to 20 kilometers, something like that. This is the zone where uh, any army wants, uh, be them starting from the brigade to division level, they want you to deploy your force to build yourself, you know, into columns. And then, you know, this cover zone becomes the zone of the active combat. They have this uh, about 11 kilometers of the fields and some forests. They uh, did what it was, incursion, essentially a raid in the... I would say, well, not brigade. Initially, it started with battalion size. Now it, it went into brigade size incursion. They encountered the first line of defense of Russian armed forces. They broke through, obviously, a very small triplier force of the border guards. And now we see what was about to happen. And it did happen. And we're looking at the complete annihilation of the so called. Uh, offensive, as if there was any other outcome, you know. So, and what can I say? Uh, yet again, London and Washington parade themselves as military amateurs who they say they never did, had anything to do with this. Everybody understands they planned it and there was a blessing on part of these two capitals uh, to do this. And yes, uh, I looked at the, today's development uh, yeah, the, uh, a number of the equipment uh, dropped uh, kind of significantly, uh, annihilated or destroyed on the Ukrainian side because they simply are, ran out of the most of this uh, armor. And now basically what is happening, that is why it was called not a uh, troops operation, which is usually the whole army deal, you know, with the march of the reserves. And it's essentially the, uh, you know, martial law is established. No, it's counter-terrorist operation. This is precisely what it is. Those, the groups, uh, including the diversionary recon groups, larger diversionary recon groups of Russian army, they literally have to extricate those guys in hiding in forests and... Uh, it's a grim situation. The, uh, I mean, the slaughter there of the Ukrainian forces is just absolutely unimaginable. Literally, piles of bodies. And I mean, it's not figure of speech. You can look it up. It's all over social media. And yeah, it just they now beg in their radio channels to extricate them, but it's impossible anymore. And they will die most likely or surrender as they many of them do. So, yeah, it's it's ended bad for them. Yes, I mean, there were intimations for many critical of NATO and uh, the Ukraine project that this was a trap set by Russia. But it appears that this is almost like a self-made trap set by NATO, because as you said, Andre, this is fully backed by NATO. And I just want to pull up what The New York Times said at the very end of their article titled here russia seeks to turn humbling incursion into military gains you scroll to the end 
And here you have ultimately the expansion of the war into new areas will over time favor the side with bigger resources that Russian analysts have said. With triple the population and a larger industrial base, that side remains Russia. So, Andre, given this, why then take part in such a catastrophic incursion? Why, why do this when the result uh, was uh, maybe foretold? Well, first, there are many people who sit at the Rammstein base and in Brussels and other bunkers in already Polish territory who plan this. On the American part, it's a uh, three-star general Aguto and a bunch of his, you know, the operational planners from Pentagon. I'm not talking about London. And nobody from a British military can be taken seriously because this is a joke. I mean, they don't have experience. They don't have understanding of the modern war. And, of course, they don't know Russia. Even this piece of the... Uh, from New York Times, uh, the conclusion, the phrase tells you how much they are detached from the reality because uh, there is no really big industrial base left in Ukraine. And uh, in terms of uh, population, Russia is about seven and a half times larger because la latest data uh, testifies to the fact that uh, probably... Uh, 20 million people are left now only in Ukraine, you know, because there are millions of them who, you know, just uh, escaped the country. And, of course, you understand that also what it lost, it lost the uh, four critical oblast uh, regions in, on the east. So, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's operational art. Pure and simple. There is operational planning, which is, of course, almost precise science, but then there is an operational art. This is when you play with your large operational strategic level, you know, formations, and you make even the, your own sometimes setback, you make it into the uh, uh, political and military triumph. This And this is exactly what happened. I don't think so. There was a trap. There was the, from what I know, I'm not going to expand on this for now. I need the confirmation, but I know it's with a high degree of veracity, so to speak, uh, that uh, uh, there was a real screw up on the part of the Kursk uh, 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 civilian administration. And this has already been kind of, you know, investigated. But army performed as army performs. That's what they do. And yeah, I mean, come on. <laughs> you know, the Russian army is probably, arguably, well, not arguably, it's the best army in the world right now. And the question is now uh, uh, what Russians are going to do. And I can tell you immediately, it's not just buffer zone. It's probably going to be the Sumy Oblast from where this whole thing originated. Eventually, it will fall to Russia too. Not that Russians really want it, but, you know, it's, uh, it is what it is. Right, right. What have you made about the uh, talk about Vladimir Putin and how he's responded and how overall Russia has responded to this incursion? Because there's been a lot of enthusiasm in the collective West, especially in the media, talking about how not, not only was uh, the particular civilian administration that you're talking about caught by surprise, but really, the entirety of Russia's forces were caught by surprise, and that uh, this has changed the course of the conflict, in, especially in the realm of how Russia portrays itself in this conflict. What do you make of all of that? Because uh, for so many days, there were talks about Vladimir Putin being furious and wanting revenge and then now they're talking about Vladimir Putin being very calm in his response to this incursion what have you made of this uh chatter well i can make only one thing about it and i am on record for a decade uh nato is militarily incompetent all their planners and all that and uh, you know you don't have to go far to understand that these people who planned this whole de debacle for nato and the combined west in ukraine so the only thing they are good at are narratives that's the only thing 
And those narratives are run, you know, if you look attentively at people of the caliber of Petraeus or Keen and, you know, those people who continue to parade themselves as their, well, incompetence, uh, that's the only thing they can do. They love to make those great, grandiose statements while having no understanding what kind of uh, force they are dealing with, what are strategic imperatives for Russia. They just narrate. That's what they do. They make this up. You know, it's an echo chamber. They still, you know what, they still just salivate on their, you know, beating their crap out of this, you know, five-year-old old in the sandbox, you know, a Saddam's army, and thinking that this was the it, it thing. That they are shown really what modern war is. And again, Russia is not employing all of its uh, uh, might. It's just doing all things necessary to achieve, uh, which now is the political objective of, of much larger than uh, Ukraine. We're looking at a global shift in balance of power. And these people didn't get the message. They believe their own, you know, well, their own narratives, okay? They, you know, propaganda, they bought it themselves. And they are paying this for now. Now And now, the, of course, what they do, I mean, they, the whole uh, media complex, uh, essentially, it's military industrial congressional media complex. That's how it's being called uh, correctly. They have the, well, some people say, oh, they don't want to, uh, you know, wars to have any kind of conclusion, but they just want them perpetual war uh, because they make money on this. Well, that's all fine and dandy, but not in case with Russia, because you're losing your reputation as the, you know, technological and military power. And that's exactly what it happened. And now, if you look attentively uh, at this incursion, which it is incursion, it never reached beyond the 150 square kilometers. Evidently, they are also mathematically and geographically challenged. And you will see yourself, it's literally littered with NATO issues, you know, of hardware. From Well, today, yet another Abrams was burned. You look at those Bradleys and you look at those martyrs and everything, they're just burned all over the place there. They, that's what it is. And uh, it doesn't perform at all. And fact is, Russians are really glad that they also have been allowed to kill more patriots. And there you go. Hmm. Yeah, well, there's been kind of a non, this incursion, the enthusiasm around it, appears to be a, a sh maybe a, a shift in how Ukraine is being pushed to fight this conflict because we've heard, I believe, even in just this is August 21st, so even in just the last 24 hours or so, uh, they've tried to invade uh, Bryansk. Yeah. And before yeah. that, they tried Belgoro. I mean, not, it wasn't, it hasn't been successful, but is this, is this something we're seeing where uh, Ukraine is going to be uh, diverting its NATO uh, hardware and all, whatever's left of its army to Russia and to the Russia's border. Is that is that the new phase here of how they're going to? Oh fight? no, no diversionary recon groups, diversionary recon groups uh, have been in and out uh, constantly since the start, practically since the start of the special military operation. So let's not uh, um, uh, kind of mistake things like breakthrough and, you know, brigade size force, which still ended up in catastrophe. We're talking about some people say it was almost company and a half size diversionary uh, recon uh, group, which tried to get into Bransk region. It was obviously killed, repelled. But that's what many people do not understand about Kursk. Uh, General Staff was viewing uh, three of them, Belgorod, Kursk, and Bransk, from their get-go as potential uh, breakthrough points for some force of the armed forces of Ukraine. They were equal probable. That means what? Each of them had the same probability of the incursion. So, and, uh, well, the, it happened in Kursk, and uh, as I already stated, it is more, a, a lot of questions will be towards civilian administration, but people in Belgorod and Bransk were, were ready. And army, listen, army doesn't stand on the border. Many people do not understand. The border guards stand on the border. They have what it called the uh, uh, units or uh, basic tactical formation, not formation, it's a unit 
called Zastava, which is literally watch point. It's usually an enforced uh, platoon type uh, operation. It's tripwire essentially, and they those Zastava, so to speak, they uh, you know placed along the border. And they serve as, you know, the initial units, which usually take the brunt of the first assault, depending on the force. But army stands within, in the, in the depth. And it usually starts because, obviously, these are border uh, districts now. They are deployed somewhat between 10 to 15 kilometers in depth. And then after that, you know, once something happens, they begin to redeploy towards the enemy. And yeah, uh, this time they, as I already stated, the farthest they got was something like 12 and a half, a half kilometers. And again, people look at the map, they don't understand. This is not how it happens. You know, the map should be drawn not in some kind of the solid color things, you know, it should be drawn in those, you know, spots where the units are formations are located. And uh, yeah, Bransk today, they tried, they said up to 200 p uh, personnel, they tried to penetrate, been met with the fire, lost many people, nothing new. Russians do the same actually, so yeah. It's the version of recon groups, <laughs> that's what they do. All right, All right. Uh, then, you know, we have, a situation here uh, for the last several months where NATO, it feels like this was uh, what happened in Kursk while we couldn't have necessarily predicted it would happen. Um, it, there's been so many indications from the United States and from NATO that they were going to green light Ukrainian attacks on Russian soil. They've been happening, but it seems like the green lighting of it was an indication that they would escalate, they would get larger. Uh, how does Russia respond to what seems to be something that's going to occur uh, more frequently as Ukraine gets more and more desperate? And of course, as the U.S. and NATO become more desperate in trying to keep this whole thing together, how does Russia respond? No, I mean, uh, they uh, want to uh, provoke Russia into some a larger response because obviously United States needs to get the hell out of this mess which it created together with these chihuahuas in London. But uh, the point is, uh, Russia has no, uh, you know, intention to uh, drive now, let's say, attack Poland. Although today with the attempt, uh, uh, it was the Cessna knockoff by Poland, A22, that's how it's called. They tried to launch it at Alenigorsk. Uh, <clears throat> at the main uh, uh, air base in uh, Murmansk region. It was obviously shut down, but uh, yeah, that's the only thing they can do. They can provoke. They don't have resources. They don't have capability to fight Russia conventionally. And uh, yeah, it's all about narratives. It's all about poking and pretending. Uh, some people in London, uh, including through their media. They think that uh, it's United Kingdom invasion of Russia. This is how pathetic those people are. They're just downright morons, you know. So they are small people. They try to, you know, just measure up to the Gulliver. But, you know, what can I say? Uh, none of them, NATO doesn't have resources to fight serious conventional war in Eastern Ukraine, uh, not only Eastern Ukraine, Eastern Europe. And that is why they will do those escalations, trying to provoke Russia at something, trying to get something in those, you know, opa opaque, you know, murky waters to get some political things. Because the only thing they know, and you have to understand, all, all Western uh, elites, without exception, from Washington to Berlin to London, they don't know how to run state. They don't know what statesmanship is. The only thing which they are driven by are uh, internal political dynamics and interest as, you know, uh, related to their ambition and the desire to stay in power through their, you know, faking elections. You know, that's pretty much it. Now, lastly, on the uh, battlefield front, uh, uh, Andre, I wanted to ask about the recent gains that are occurring for Russia during this Kursk incursion. No. It's one of the things that I think is now shocking the Western mainstream media. They're coming to terms with this reality that Russia has now taken the uh, 
uh, area called New York. They're moving towards Pokrovsk. Mm -hmm. And how can I mean uh, this one? Right. And the, so the front line, it appears for Ukraine, is collapsing. Talk about how Russia has been able to do this while the Western mainstream media has uh, made it appear like Russia is the one that is being overextended and Russia is the one that has been exposed here. How has it been exposed if it seems like the front line remains in Russia's favor all throughout this incursion? The whole idea of these amateurs from London, from their general staff, uh, and again, uh, London won't be able to, uh, you know, uh, invade Leeds, let alone invade Russia. And uh, so um, these people, they are one trick ponies. They are rigid. They don't know military history. They don't uh, study it properly because obviously you understand British uh, think that they defeated Hitler. Americans think that they defeated Hitler. And yeah, there's some those sideshow, you know, those Ruskies, you know, those Red Army. That helps somewhat. When you have your whole knowledge based be, based around it, and when you have former Wehrmacht losers writing you your uh, field manuals, this is the expected result. And none of them, they know what Russia is economically, militarily, culturally. And so they operate under rigid operational views. For example, okay, let's do the incursion in Kursk, okay? So that means that Russians will be forced to, uh, you know, remove some of the reserves from their other access, operational access, and that will make life for uh, whatever uh, remains of the armed forces of Ukraine easier. They are primitive thinkers. They, as I already stated, they are most understanding about war is from Hollywood. And so suddenly, they knowing that they, you know, thinking that that what should happen. They don't understand how Russian uh, reserves work. And as a result, yeah, Russians transferred elements of the uh, Ahmad Brigade and 800 tenths uh, Marine uh, uh, Brigade, Naval Infantry Brigade, and some uh, elements of the special uh, uh, forces of the special operations. But instead of that, instead of that and guess what? Not only it didn't slow down anything, it's actually accelerated. You look at Pakrovsk, it's a catastrophe there. You're absolutely correct. There is another cauldron which was formed. So we have now the advancement towards Kupiansk, and they have to sit now and uh, ask themselves a question, uh, how many times should we miscalculate? Well, you have to learn the military science properly, you know, but they don't. They invented this military history, this confabulated thing. Again, uh, look at uh, American military record. It loses wars to the left and to the right, to everybody. And starting from Korea. And then you suddenly recognize that you have to fight the now most advanced military in the world. And even they, they have a huge advantage. They have ISR, uh, Intelligence, uh, Surveillance and Reconnaissance Complex, which is unimpeded, especially the satellite constellation. In real war, that satellite constellation will be suppressed. But they even with that, they cannot do anything. And guess what? Yeah, you're absolutely correct. On Pakros, we have a catastrophe there for armed forces of Ukraine. Uh, Russian forces now are within four kilometers from Pakros, which is a very critical, actually, the uh, um, transportation hub. And it has everything to do with the logistics of the uh, uh, major sector of the Ukrainian front. Now you have Kupiansk, Russians going back to Kupiansk. And once they are in Kupiansk, that mean, means that they will be on the shores of the Askol River. And once you cross Askol River, my God, the things change dramatically. I mean, strategically. No, well, they already have been changing, but uh, strategically. But and yes. Now they have to ask the question, why didn't they do their homework? I can tell you why. They swallowed hook, line, and sinker Ukrainian propaganda. So there you go. So And that tells you the professional level of those people in Pentagon and in London. That means they cannot even distinguish uh, where is their you know, outright BS and where there is some grain of truth. But when you look attentively at the, as I already stated, the, at the uh, academic and uh, operational level of American generals, this is pathetic, man. 
and not to mention the fact that many of them they don't even have the fundamental military education some of them graduated uh, uh west point but other than that my gosh these are people who have all kinds of degree ranging from sociology to uh you know uh to biology good god how do you how are you going to fight <laughs> in the war of the 21st century and that's what is happening right now